Welcome back to What Have You. I am Rachel Jankovic. I'm Becca Merkel. And we're on video yeah. today. Yeah. Why, Becca? Why are we on video today? We are on video because the men of Canon <laughs> Press have summoned us here to be on video. It's actually because there's an Even Exile documentary coming out next yes. Friday. Next Friday, meaning May 6th, depending yep. on what day you watch this. Uh, yeah, so a week from today. Yeah. And that's Next why Friday. the men of Canon got us yeah. here to do a filmed what have you. And I'm a little not sure because usually I always yawn in a what have you. And I'm wondering if yeah. I will do that. Well, I always what notice it in the middle of Rachel the yawn. Rachel always does this and then she goes back <laughs> and forth because she's I'm... lining up a spot on the windshield. <laughs> So if I, you just do that. And I can do that to look natural. Or, or I note bird life and try to figure out what's happening with birds. And all yeah. of that you'll have to do without this week. Mm -hmm. Wow. We talk. Okay. Let's talk about Eve in Exile. What got you to write that book in the first place? <laughs> I feel like that goes way back to our childhood, you mm -hmm. know, because the 90s, not childhood, high school, really. Mm -hmm. I feel like the 90s, so I graduated in 94, so early 90s, I feel like it was being, there was a lot of, it was sort of Josh Harris was doing his thing, okay. there was yeah. a lot of homeschool world The first wave of Josh on. Harris's thing. When he was kissing the first thing goodbye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he carried on for so long doing that. Um, but there was, there was kind of this alternative culture that was mm -hmm. happening in the Christian world. And we were, I suppose, our own kind of alternative culture in a weird yeah. way, but it was never that. And there were people we knew, crossed paths with, whatever, that were doing this, like, we're out of the world system, we're Wouldn't that home. also have been early days of, or the heyday of vision forum, more like yeah. costumey sorts of, like we believe in the principles that people believed in mm -hmm. when they were founding America. So we're going yeah. to pretend to be those people. Yeah. We're going to dress up like that. Yeah, and there was kind of this old fashioned -y vibe in some places going on, but it was this mm -hmm. homeschool thing, and it was kind of a knee-jerk reaction out of feminism and the general worldliness of everything. And so that was admirable, but then they just it was just terrible, some of the stuff that was going on. And we thought it was really weird at the time, and obviously, Dad had started Logos School when I went into kindergarten, so I'd been going all the way through it. New St. Andrews was just about to come online, sort of, and so he was all about giving his daughters an education. Like, that yeah. was his long-term vision, and we saw a lot of other people who were doing this thing of girls will just need to get married and have babies so they don't need an education. Like so, feminism is wrong, so any overreaction from yeah. feminism is yeah. therefore right or biblical. Yeah. Which it's just sort of we'll do we the never opposite have, thing. Or we've if it never makes, believed that. Yeah, if yeah. it makes feminists upset, then that means That's it's That's what correct. we love, yeah. Yeah, and it's hard to not make feminists upset, but <laughs> um, that shouldn't be maybe your guiding principle. <laughs> um, so anyhow, I feel like it was really in that moment where it was, I was going to go to college. Mm -hmm. There were vocal people saying that's wrong and that's not a gentle and quiet spirit and you shouldn't go to college and your girls don't need an education and just that whole thing was an active conversation. So it was relevant to me because I was <laughs> I was the guinea pig. I was going into NSA right. as the only girl the first year. So if there were people... And the way it was in our church, you were the only, you were the oldest of the children yeah. in our church. Yeah. So it was not even like, you weren't just yes. the oldest in our family. You were... I was the thin It was the a wedge. really, yeah, it was a really yeah. interesting dynamic yeah. in, a, Absolutely. in a community that had become all about education and then right. building elementary school. It's like, and now we have a college student. <laughs> The college group. We had to grow our own. It's like we, our community also did not have old people in it. No. We had to grow no. our own. Like we, and we have yeah. now. Now yeah. we have a lot of elderly people, but we didn't but back the, then. When the church started in the 70s, it was just a bunch of like college kids. Yeah. Jesus and people, so church. It took a while before the generations filled before out. Before we have all the generations yeah. in the church. So yeah. I was definitely on the front end of that. So it was an active conversation. Do women need an education? 
If so, why? And it was very relevant to me because whenever that conversation was being had, <laughs> it was not hypothetical. It was, we all know we're talking about Becca. Well, we also, <laughs> we also had a really interesting, that was just a weird church dynamic at that yeah. moment because it yeah. was actually a time when a family moved here that were very vocally. So it was actually a new input that happened yes. where it had not been here. And then yeah. suddenly there was a very vocal, hospitable family that was saying women don't need to be yeah. educated. And that's a really bizarre dynamic that a church has to weather yeah. like yeah. that. It had Because it would be the topic <clears throat> of men's meetings. It was like, no, yeah. we are going to hash this out. And it wasn't like tonight we're talking about Becca. It was no. tonight we're talking about weird new ideas that have come into the church and why we're not accepting them. <laughs> yeah. Let's also, hash it out. Subtext. We're talking about Becca. So well, Becca might be our our key <laughs> example, but we yeah. but it was not yeah it, yeah it was an interesting. So I think because of that, then I went through NSA, and then my senior thesis was actually about the role of women in various cultures. So it was actually about the relationship between theology and the treatment of women, right? In a like case study of four different cultures, and uh, so I was kind of like it was a very relevant question at the time. And so I think then in whatever year I wrote Even Exile, I think there'd been this new sort of bubble of talk about Christian feminism, which is a, of course the completely other side of the pendulum right. from what the conversation had been like yeah, in at the that 90s. time. Yeah. And now it was like a bunch of Christians trying to accommodate feminism and make it work, you know, with Christianity and so that's when I wrote Even Exile, which your NSA thesis also turned into... Yoo-hoo. Yeah. It, but that's because I thought it was like once I wrote my NSA thesis on the Christian identity, the problem of the self, the philosophy of the self. It wasn't called Christian identity. It was philosophy the uh, thesis. But once having worked through that subject matter, mm -hmm. it's like something you didn't think about until once you've really thought about it, you see it everywhere. It just comes up everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like you're like, has this always been everywhere? Or is yeah. it just now that I put time into thinking about it, I see the fruit of it everywhere. Yeah. And then when you fast forward and people are always would ask me mothering questions, how often the mothering question seemed like a philosophical problem, not a, yeah. not a this is not just a little problem. Back to even exile, though, one of the things that I think of all the time now when you talk about women and their role in the church and in culture building and just what women are for, one of the things that I think we have a huge shortage of, and this is actually the topic for our pre-conference to Grace Agenda, is imagination, oh, women yeah. and imagination. And that, but I think of this, you mentioned your thesis, and I remember I've read most of it now, but that book, um, Embarrassment, of Riches. Embarrassment of Riches, you reading that book about the Dutch Reformation and mm -hmm. the way it was, like, I think it's even not much of that book that's about no, the women. No, it's very small now. It's like a small yeah. section of a huge book that yeah. is about the women and what a bizarre yeah. impression <clears throat> the women of Holland gave other people during the Reformation yeah. um, because they were highly educated and they were intimidating. They were incredible housekeepers. But not to their they, husbands. That no, was the thing. No, they ran yeah. their homes. It was like yeah. visiting Frenchmen that were scared out of their brains of these women. But their own their own society functioned very naturally and easily. Yeah. But they were. It was a lot of women who spoke five languages and had. And they were. There are funny stories about people getting in big trouble for like wearing their shoes into the house. Like yeah. tracking mud into the yeah. house of these women yeah. who were very well, they were Dutch after yeah all. they were Dutch and these are people that did get up at dawn to go scrub their front steps regardless of if anything had happened there they just <laughs> took care of it but it was it, but I remember that book you reading that book mm -hmm. impacted my understanding my imagination of what women are supposed to be like. yeah yeah not because I thought those particular women are the women that we're supposed to be like. But I think if you have a broader, like tying in education, broader education, you can take different things from all different cultures and think mm -hmm. that's a beautiful expression of femininity or how women can mm -hmm. be a real helpmate or, um, but if you're super narrow and you read, you know, one like romantic fiction, historical fiction about Abigail Adams, and then you're like, 
that's my whole vision. That's my whole plan. <laughs> I'm like I've, I've narrowed in on one thing that one woman did well yeah. one time, or I've decided 50s housewives or yep. a pioneer or a Victorian woman. Like that's the ultimate expression of yeah. femininity. femininity. Instead of thinking there's genuinely lovely things throughout all of history mm -hmm. in different places. That it's like are, traveling. It's like yeah. bringing things home from your travels. You know, like if you went to India and enjoyed it, it doesn't mean you have to then make your whole entire house a right. replica of what but, you saw there, but you could bring things back and then put them right. in your own context. But reading about it and learning about people in a much broader historical, like a, a much broader picture of what women have, how women have been used through history mm -hmm. to build the kingdom, advance the kingdom, yeah. that that makes your own imagination broader than to think this is not yeah. about me wearing the right apron and getting the jello right. salad in a mold. It's well, not I, about that. I also think what's interesting, I remember being very formative in doing that thesis and looking at the, specifically the Dutch women, um, is my thesis was about how much your theology impacts what women are like mm -hmm. in the cultural society. Treatment of women. So basically the relationship between God and man in whatever worldview, whatever religion, that relationship is then reflected in microcosm in the men to women dynamic. Right. So it's like in Islam, you have Allah is distant. He does not have power. a son. There's no, power. Yeah. there's no God incarnate. He's up there. We're down here. We submit, we obey. And he End doesn't give, Allah doesn't give himself in any no. way to his No, he's people. just there. Yeah. We obey. Mm -hmm. And then you look at, Muslim men and Muslim women and that's exactly what you see so mm -hmm. what you believe about God and what you believe about ultimate things actually has very practical implications specifically coming out in what the women are like well so, if you look at in our own culture today men treat women and women treat themselves like they are disposable items they are they're not unique they're not long term they're yeah. not, I mean, tender. Interchangeable. They're interchangeable. Yeah. You can go through however many women you want. And you think women treat themselves that way then because how rare is it to find young women today who are actually trying to cultivate long-term skills? Like mm -hmm. if you think of something like, oh, I want to make beautiful things for my grandchildren to inherit or mm -hmm. I want to do this. That because women treat themselves like they're disposable, because it's like we have such a shallow view of femininity that we've mm -hmm. lost a ton of um, sort of that longer vision, that Christian vision that means a man and a woman stay together for eight, their life, building the next generations. You so, that allows women to actually use their strengths that mm -hmm. are totally irrelevant in our current culture. I'm having a weird thought, though, that I've never thought about before, so it might be totally... Just let topic. it rip. Just, yeah. We're on video. Let's let do it rip. a little philosophical <laughs> speculation. Okay, I'm ready. Um, so if you think about like the relationship between God and man, you know, on a macro level reflected in the genders. Yeah. And the relationship between the genders. I wonder if like at this moment we have tried to completely cut God out of the picture. There is no such thing as God. There is no God man. We're also there's trying to man. cut. We're also trying to cut man out and of the so, picture well, and make it only even, women. But there's no, well, no. But we don't even know what a woman is. We can't define we it. We can't. There's no like the difference between a man and a woman is, uh, I mean, you know, just a matter of your own free choice apparently. But I think that's really interesting that actually we've like cut yeah. one half of that equation out at the theological level, mm -hmm. and now we just can't even. But it also around. makes sense. Masculinity has been cut out. It's an un like. But in a weird way, because as yeah. much as we cut it out, we're yeah, letting it dominate. Everything. Like, yeah, yeah, like unrestricted masculinity <laughs> dominates the culture while we pretend yeah. we're having none of it. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, but I do think that the the Dutch women specifically it was interesting because it was the Protestant vision that created these women that everyone. <laughs> it's it's this funny collection of like letters from visitors to Holland from mm -hmm. other countries who would be describing to people back home yeah. what it was like. It was like their funny it was postcards really funny. back about these yeah. terrifying women. <laughs> really interesting, Who were though. allowed to talk in conversations yeah. and have opinions. Yep. And they were like, and it seems to be okay. Like, they're allowed people to People are that. allowing it. It's interesting. 
And their they, their husbands are not concerned that they're speaking out about yeah. something. Yeah, and they were like visibly <laughs> affectionate in public with their husbands, and they were yeah. had this reputation for being beautiful, and their houses were amazing, and it was clean, and nobody knew what to do. It was <laughs> this very, was at a time. Uh, this was a time where other there were other cities where people were just throwing their sewage out in those in streets the road, all the yeah. time. So you have a civilization mm -hmm. where their streets were getting washed every day. Like people are, and it was like we're doing it different. In yeah. Holland, we're not going to yeah. wallow around and so in filth. It's like as they're hammering out their doctrine of, you know, yeah, grace and everything, it came out as just this visibly different thing yeah. going on in the homes. And I just thought that was a really fascinating connection. So I think if you just seize on it because like, ooh, I love those dresses or ooh, I just think mm -hmm. it's such a cute thing they're mm -hmm. doing, you're kind of missing the Like I want to play dress up, but you're not yeah. picturing the fact that this is actually... Yeah. really significant and culture building is really significant and we act like it's something that can't still be done but mm -hmm. it's being done all the time it's just being done very badly well and i think that we think too often of ourselves as consumers of culture or connoisseurs yeah. of culture instead of the shapers of culture and i think that that's a very very different mindset mm -hmm. because you know like we like to shop and we like to you know, watch those shows and go to those places and, and right. be a connoisseur and someone who collects things sort of rather than somebody who makes, creates. And that's a huge part of femininity and what God has mm -hmm. made us to do. I love, this is off topic, but I still think it's funny. So Why I'm going to share it anyways. Why not? Uh, when America was young. So I read a book once on lace making. Just random piece of information <laughs> for you. I read that once. And it was actually a super boring book, aside from this. Aside <laughs> I was from, about to say, that's super fascinating. No, I, the book itself was not a, it was not a well-told. I'm sure there could be a great <laughs> adventure in lace making, but this was not it. This was not the uh -huh. one. But uh, counted, like, there were these meticulous French linens. They had all of this uh, way that they would match. They would count the linen threads to match the embroidery. So, like, if you were embroidering mm -hmm. a bunch of napkins you're monogramming them or something. You would count the threads mm -hmm. to get it exactly matching on all of them. Mm -hmm. And this was the kind of thing that women were putting their efforts into. And American women, and I just think this is really funny because it's a little foretaste of what America really is. And it just started out from, from the get-go. Uh, the French really looked down on the American women's edition of this because they figured out that if you took a snuff box and rubbed it in your hair I guess it was the grease from your hair you could transfer Why a snuff box though the kind of metal I guess it was okay. you could transfer the design from one embroidered thing to the other one by rubbing it on it it would like shine pieces of the linen and they're like we're gonna skip that whole mess of <laughs> counting the threads and we're just gonna do a yeah. rough approximation yeah, right. and get it done in half the time and, and <laughs> might they sacrifice some of the precision and it, well but they were very looked down <laughs> on and i thought that that just is actually yeah. super funny in a lot yeah, of ways right. that they were like we have more work to do here we can't just embroider yeah. our linens all day it's a national personality <laughs> Being formed I, I, there. right at the get go, mm -hmm. like we mm -hmm. have more to do than, <laughs> and also than we're probably going to stop making it as beautiful. That happened in a hot also. minute. Mm -hmm. We will, we'll quit. Well, because there's a lady that I follow who collects antique linens, not like mm -hmm. vintage ones from the 60s, but like antique, yeah, like 1500s stuff, gorgeous yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. And it is shocking to me when i Didn't think you about send me that lace that was all beetle wings the beetle yeah. like because it's like the no. iridescent beetle it's an wings. entire dress yeah that was like instead it's of crazy. sequins it was beetle wings that were sewn all over it in these patterns no but i just I have a hard like, time getting into that but i'm no. like way to be resourceful guys yeah. <laughs> when yeah. you didn't have sequins You're just doing it look what you did but i do think that um with a shockingly less impressive amount of you know, tools to work with. Mm -hmm. They've made things that are so far surpassing what we do when we trundle on down to Michael's and get a little kit. Whip yeah. out a little thing. Although I will say, in, like there are things that I learned to do because I'm sure I've told this story on the podcast when I've referenced my great upcoming work about the <laughs> spiritual journey of crafting. 
kidding. When you finally I'm come never out with gonna that, write that, we'll have somebody go back and put together a montage of all the times you talked about it. Yeah, I uh -huh. talk about it because it's shocking how many spiritual lessons <laughs> you find if you're trying to learn how to do something that you don't know how to do. And it takes a lot of work and then you, you do learn, but you also have to learn how to tear things back out and mm -hmm. whatever. You know, there's a lot to learn. But there were, it was sometime, our grandma was super capable mm -hmm. and she was capable. I think when, wasn't it when uh, granddad was, she decided to teach herself to sew. And the first thing that she ever sewed was a little wool lined coat for her daughter yeah, with a fur collar, like, like, like a full, you know, whatever. She just, she just did well at these things. And she did stuff. I mean, she did a lot of stuff our whole life, knitting, sewing, quilting, everything. Yeah. And I think I had some time in high school when, when I was like, here's the thing that your great grandma made. And here's the thing that your grandma made. And I was like, what did I ever do? <laughs> like, I, ne I never did anything. Yeah. Like, what will I only hand off to my children? What ancestors behind me made and nothing? Mm -hmm. Like, I never yeah. contributed to this. It's just yeah. like, because the things that they did uh, are not, a lot of them are very outdated. Like, we wouldn't even use that yeah. now. It's just that yeah. it matters that they made it. It's, it's. Yeah. I mean, I have a cool. lot of little, I think I grabbed them in the yard sale or something, but they're like little linen coasters with handmade lace all the way around the outside edge as a coaster. Yeah. I can't even be bothered to use a coaster at all. Yeah. Much less make <laughs> Much less little iron dainty. and starch your yeah, coasters. little dainty well, ones. Well, I went, at that time, I went on a tour of learning to do things because I was like, mm -hmm. I need to learn to do things so that I can know what things I like to do so that maybe you could get better, like you could get good at something by the time you die. Because what if you never do? In that journey, I had a really funny time where I decided I was at a needleworking place and there was a sign up sheet that said you could, like, are you interested in tatting lessons mm -hmm. or something? And I wrote my name on it. And then a woman in our church Tatting, see, I'm making it sound like I'm really into lace making, but <laughs> it was a phase. it's a small part of my life, <laughs> not a big part of my life. And but a woman in our church saw my name on the sign up, called me, and said, "Rachel, my neighbor Gladys will teach you how to tat." So as a high school kid, I went over to it was like the tatting oracle. Gladys was a hundred years old. Oh my word! And she was real excited to teach me how to tat, but mostly to tell me all about the really beautiful big sunbonnet she tatted herself that really caught eyes at church <laughs> when she was a young lady. It was a really interesting time with Gladys. Wow. But anyways, I learned how to do that. And But one of the things about this is that it has been the things that I tried to learn how to do from scratch. And I mean, like I had no, I hadn't been around people doing it. I struggled along. I tried to do it. It took a lot of work. I bring all of this up because my own daughter's just seem to start where you, you mm -hmm. struggled all the way to get to that point. Yeah. And then as soon as they turn their mind to it, they begin mm -hmm. where you got to. Mm -hmm. And that that's a, that's remarkable. And it's a wonderful thing. It's that they didn't have to start over. And I don't know how they learned things. Cause I didn't internet teach to, I feel like, I don't know how we ever managed to come up with anything because I got, went through a moment of needing to make stained glass. You did. And I did. But we, but we had to do the weirdest stuff. Yeah, like but I don't know. Go to the library and check out. out a book and when I go think to. think about it, I don't know how I figured it out because I we found out a there weird was a place in, in Spokane. Spokane. Yeah, remember. I probably looked in the Yellow Pages. I don't know. But then I, we went to the place. Dad was a champion and let me go in and buy weird bits of lead <laughs> and soldering irons and the our stuff parents, you drip our on Our parents, it. in case you wondered, were real good at they were. letting us do these I know. bad and ideas then I was that home, we had. Like, cutting glass, not knowing what I was about. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't, you do couldn't you remember like, our, look it up on YouTube. Remember our batiking phase? I, I still can't believe that mom let us no. do that. We'd just be like, how about we melt tons of I, wax and I make bet it that an the enormous house mess. Is still not recovered no, from that batik. such a horrible mess. We melted so much wax and then painted it all over this Oh, it was a mess on the fabric. And we and it had was no horrible. good premise of what good. we were trying to accomplish. And then you dye it, and so basically, and then we, you boil it to melt the wax we back put out a of it. Skim coat of wax <laughs> on every surface. I think we did it more than in one that time whole too. The kitchen, because you're supposed to do it multiple times. But you know, I mean, yes, our daughters have access to more on the yeah. internet, but they also have more. They being around it, and yeah. you understand a lot more of it than you. 
thought. But you mom would. was always making things. She was she was making all sorts of she stuff. She was, our but whole she childhood. was not. So like, I think I was impacted by the fact that mom took weaving classes when she was. Uh, maybe when we were little, but she, we had a loom and a spinning wheel. In I know, but I don't remember her really weaving things on it. We had it, and then she got rid of it at some point. But I think, for whatever reason, I know that impacted me being interested in it, like me thinking, oh, well, I want to try that. Well, she bought me a little Fisher Price loom, and I wove scarfs like you can't mm -hmm. even imagine. All, and then you wove so your famous scarfs. rug in the hall. <laughs> <laughs> Not on the Fisher Price loom. Sadly. You've told that you've told that on I the have, podcast, but I you have. should still tell it again, Becca. Becca. Well, it was a good idea that it was. A <laughs> I didn't see it being a mistake either. So no, it none was, of us saw what was going to happen think, with I that. I mean, true innovation. <laughs> you know, I. It was all started because somebody gave us a set of placemats. <laughs> For our wedding, and they were cool, chunky, like a rag rug, but a chunky rag rug, but it was a placemat, and I was like, that would be cooler as a rug, like an actual <laughs> rug, and so, but it was a very simple, you know, you know I mean, it's, it's like over, it's rug. like over, under, over, under, like, we know how to it's do like this, we've had, a, we've had a pot holder and then it's rags. I can figure yeah. this out, I was like, I've been there with the Fisher Price, I know yeah, how it works, we can do it. So I talked Ben, because uh, I was married, yes, at this time. Newlyweds. Talked Ben it was into, like, <laughs> I was like, I have this amazing idea. So there was, <laughs> we had a, a hall that had a good long stretch of wall with no doors in it. So I got him to hang two by fours, one at the bottom and one at the top, <laughs> maybe a couple two by fours, because it was a big dude of a rug. <laughs> and it was Only like, for a time. <laughs> He, she put he a goes, ton of nails I in it. I put a million nails and across warped at the top to the thing. and at the bottom. So it was like the height of our ceilings. And it was like all of this uh -huh. cotton string. And then I started weaving the rug. Did and you dye fabric I for this? I dyed it because yeah. I wanted it to be the mm -hmm. right shade of blue, which of course I couldn't find. So I was buying muslin just by yeah. the bolt, dyeing it blue, tearing it into strips, and then just weaving it. And I did. It's coming along I gloriously on that wall. I wove that, that thing right on up. And initially, I remember, you know, you have to sit on the floor and scooch, scooch, scooch. And then, you know, then the sweet spot was when you could stand up and do it. And then you're, like, getting up and down off of a chair trying to weave yeah. at the top. Anyway, it took me, like, a while to get that done. Because <laughs> I didn't work on it incessantly. It was just every so often I'd throw in a few more loops of dyed muslin. Anyway, then we go to... <laughs> take it off <laughs> <laughs> and tied it all off and everything at the bottom of the top and took it down and it just <laughs> shrank <laughs> into essentially the pot holder <laughs> it was probably like 300 yards of fabric in this wad because it was so loose, it was like, I don't know what I was doing wrong. You were not beating it or compacting it? Well, I it was or... with my fingers. Yeah, but that but won't not do. With that the... won't do, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, it, I put it, I was like, well, mm, it's a, <laughs> hmm. But I tried to put it under the, under the bed, and it didn't even stick out. It was like supposed to be in the bedroom, you know? And it, was like, and it sort of like and this came is how out. you get wise in crafting mm -hmm. and why we should write a book about and lessons why you're that like, you've learned. People who know how to make rugs are amazing. I've figured some yeah. things out that I have not figured I out. I had a um, real winner of a knit <laughs> sweater that I made one time because I was really just learning how to make a sweater at all. Like things like yeah. sleeves, collar, how, like there were a lot of details of how to knit Mm -hmm. shapes that I did yeah. not know and I could and so uh, I think I maybe had knit a baby sweater or I thought oh at the time I feel like I have to give a reference that this was a time where super chunky sweaters was actually in for a hot <laughs> second so it was still a horrible idea but it was the idea was you could buy sweaters okay. this way uh, mom bought me this Vogue knitting pattern book and there was this <laughs> super duper chunky wool sweater. I was like, that looks like feasible. Seems like something I could do. So I went and bought this, it was red. I bought this wool that I hate even now probably because of this 
episode. I still can't <laughs> abide it. Knit this whole sweater. I mean, this thing was so, it was bulky wool held double and knit into a sweater. Oh. Not gonna flatter anyone. <laughs> It's like wearing my rug. Oh my word, yeah. <laughs> and it fit me in everything. And I wore it one time and I was so claustrophobic the entire time mm -hmm. I was in it that mm -hmm. I never put that thing on again. Yeah. So then I decided to felt it. Because after having oh. it loiter around for a long time, there's just a truck backing up. Ignore it. <laughs> Ignore the beeping pin The ambiance. Yeah. Anyone who listens to what have you. They're knows, not upset about they these know sort to of interruptions. Ignore the ambiance. Yeah. So anyways. I had this horrible sweater lurking in my life. And I was like, well, it's nice wool. Maybe I could felt it and like sew it into a bag or something. Mm -hmm. So I felted it. I, wa I washed it in hot. So you know that means the wool shrinks and grabs onto itself. And it makes matted. like a solid yeah. fabric. And it came out <laughs> of the washing machine like a fire hydrant. And it was, <laughs> it was actually so thick and so it stood up by itself <laughs> like you couldn't even make it into a bag like it was the most untenable situation you and could have just sewed a bottom on it it was you could have just had a can. and i think it wouldn't dry it was like so <laughs> thick and nasty and it had the, and the sleeves just stuck off <laughs> And I was so over it. My little <laughs> moment of wanting to repurpose it was past. Oh, yeah. And I went and threw it out on a garbage pile. And I, somehow, I used to remember it being like sticking off a pile of garbage, this little fire hydrant of a sweater. I remember throwing my rug in the dumpster. Being like, <laughs> let's let it go. Farewell. This is when I always say, let your ideas die with dignity. Like, just go yeah. try it. Because what if Becca today was still thinking... Anytime yeah. I want to make a rug, I'll do it on my hall mm -hmm. wall. I can you do it. You know what, though, today, I'm Becca capable. is still thinking. This Becca is still thinking that stained glass is a good idea to do. Becca's <laughs> going to have a little stained glass revival. I don't feel like I thoroughly exhausted that one. I think I'm done making rag rugs. I think <laughs> I've traveled that path, but I wouldn't be surprised if stained glass has to make a, a resurgence. Mm. I don't think that that would be weird. Is stained no. glass, I wonder about stained glass. Weaving has a really unique piece of the world weaves. It's not, in fact, I remember when I first got a loom, Luke, Luke went and looked at the Palouse Weavers Guild, I think, you know, like whatever, some Weavers Guild mm -hmm. thing. And he was like, hmm, look, <laughs> that picture of everyone together. He was like, I see you're really in the up and coming craft. Because <laughs> it's, it's not. It's the craft for people who started doing it in the 70s and have yeah. been doing it ever since. But apparently yeah. in, in weaving, nobody in the weaving world is into making tutorials or posting them. Like you actually um, can't. It's not a world where people are constantly updating the internet okay. with what happens. Mm -hmm. So you can find a, there's like a shocking dearth of information <laughs> about that. And I wonder if stained glass has people who share or people who don't. I don't know. I haven't checked in yeah. in the recent but times. Knitting has the world's biggest yeah. chatterboxes are yeah. now all on the internet yeah. with every piece of knitting mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. Not so with weaving. <laughs> they don't share. They recommend you come to retreats somewhere in New Hampshire to check out a technique. <laughs> you just can't find out stuff. Yeah. Hmm. How did we get here, do you think? I don't know. Imagination. I think I was trying to say that even if you haven't learned anything, doing things and trying to learn yeah. does actually make your daughters. It does actually it does mm -hmm. actually pull along a lot of people around you. Like yeah. women it, like if there's one woman in the church who's done all the work to learn something, it actually serves everyone. People can ask mm -hmm. this person mm -hmm. and get a totally. lot of like it it is not just you learning a skill that only you would ever access for any reason. It actually mm -hmm. shares much more broadly. Yeah. And I, that's the thing we've talked about in our church. It's really an interesting dynamic as we have a lot of well-educated, well-spoken, thoughtful women who are still prioritizing being in the home. Mm -hmm. Like, well, actually that's one of the things I really love about the documentary is how many ladies yeah. in the community are all the B-roll, right, Alec? They're just all the <laughs> doing their thing. I mean, they're just yeah. like doing the stuff that they always do, mm -hmm. and it's like a lot of very accomplished, hardworking, creative women mm -hmm. who are doing 
Lots of different stuff. I mean, it's it's definitely not the one size fits all no, little cookie not like cutter. A cookie cu yeah, like this is what it looks like to be a faithful Christian homemaker. It's like there's so much scope. But there are things that that women just operate this way. Like this is what trends. Like mm -hmm. people just this is how. Like I think it's a thing that can be good or bad. But it is it can be used for culture building is that women love to share. They love to learn things. They love to share things. They inspire each other. So you have somebody in the church will get good at like fancy pastries. And then everyone's like, I got to try that. Like it mm -hmm. it's a thing that people are like, oh, that's interesting. Like I'll work on that. And then there will be a little, we'll go through a little period of splurge where everyone's Everyone's sort of interested in that and working on it. And then something else comes mm -hmm. up and people mm -hmm. are all doing that. And I love that. It's like the women really pull each other along, not through any kind of coercive, we all have to do yeah. thus or, and such, or but through actual interest and yeah. desire. Because I do think it can go off the rails quite easily when women start getting competitive or they start yeah. guarding their recipe because nobody else is allowed to make it because I'm the one that makes it you know like that actually mm -hmm. is a thing that can really get actually that was a real that was a real 50s era situation the like state fair competition secret I think family it's recipes older than that too yeah probably yeah I'm picturing like Anne of Green Gablesiness. yeah you know I don't know yeah I don't know maybe. why I'm associating but with I that. think uh like that's her signature wasn't it because Current of the, wine what, or whatever it is? Wasn't it a raspberry cordial? Maybe a raspberry cordial. Well, whatever it was, it was yeah. a secret. I think that I think what I was going to say though is that is actually part of the reason why I just always, if somebody asks for me for a, a recipe, mm -hmm. I always share it, and I think it's just this just yeah. good practice. But part of the reason it is is just because share it with the seasoning left out. Oh yeah, I'm like ooh, secret. I'll ruin yeah. it by putting something so bad. So that in everyone there. will be like, when Rachel makes it, it's she makes just it better. better. Yeah, I really want that. <laughs> I really want to make sure that message goes out. Uh, what I mean is though, it's good practice for yourself to keep sharing it uh -huh. because you can at no time just retire and quit. Yeah. It, like you can't be well I noticed this with my soup night cookbook because it's the same thing it's like I felt like people need this mm -hmm. because when I was looking for big I recipes it. yeah they, it's not there and I feel like mm -hmm. this cannot be just me that has this problem but then you're like well now I'm I need to find all some new those ones. recipes yeah I'm gonna yeah. have to look around because yeah you know mm -hmm. and you yeah. and it but it's good because it's not because you have to look wrong because you won't make something that other people make. It's no, because it's you not that. yourself get tired of it. Mm -hmm. It has been around too much. Let's do something yeah. else now. Yeah. I love that. I love that the way that women actually challenge each other. But you're right. It has to be. It's only wonderful in the context of people mm -hmm. actually being open handed and loving each other in the collaborative effort of building community and culture together. Yeah. It's not individual competitive private things we should mm -hmm. all want we should all want to encourage each other yeah to do better and make more beautiful homes and yeah and the, and that's the other thing I think that the documentary is trying to bring out which is what I was trying to write about in the book which is there's a ton of scope you're not gonna run out of ideas yeah like stop being just start yeah, it's like life is and too it's short the rising tide floats all the boats mm -hmm. like you want to be in a place where lots of women are better than you are at lots of different things and, and what a gift yeah. that is and every single thing that you <clears> decide <throat> to go into and try it's like you could just spend the rest of your life there trying to perfect it and get better at it and you're never mm -hmm. gonna feel like there it is I am well, now the master and commander a of real this genre faithful podcast listeners will know that one of my life slogans is that like do things and be good at being bad at things so that by the time you're an old lady, you can be good at being good at some things <laughs> because like mm -hmm. you, it's going to take years of effort. I'm being really bad right now at gardening, but I plan, Me too. I plan by the time I'm mm -hmm. an old lady yeah. to just be nailing that, but I'm not yet. I'm just mm -hmm. not. And mm -hmm. that'll be a while. Well, and I just remember like when I was sewing all the time in high school, I was just on a it was always like, I need to wear this tomorrow. So yeah, I'm going to have to just mm -hmm. like blast through it, burn rubber as I do it. And I was just in it for speed and getting it done immediately. And then 
sort of like, well, nobody's ever going to look at the inside anyway, so it doesn't matter. Doesn't if matter it's if it's a big, snarly mess. Snaggle toothed. And then incident. at some point, it dawned on me that like, I probably could get better at making the inside look better. <laughs> and then it was like it became this whole thing that but I went that through was, of like wanting the phase. inside to be as good as the outside and then getting into like Hong Kong finishes and yeah. trying to figure out how to do welted pockets. But and, part of well, that is a whole story Part of that is a moment told. where you just, ex <laughs> where you just accept the fact that you need to be humble in yeah. learning instead yeah. of being like oh i got this it just takes yeah. me a second i'll get it it's yeah. like no this is actually taking yeah. people forever to figure yeah. out how or to I'd do this like well. basting is for people who just don't know how to do it right the first time <laughs> turns out you know what it makes a difference to the finished product if you just take a minute to you know baste. yeah i'm currently sewing together a quilt no i already sewed the quilt top but i'm currently sewing together the sandwiched layers of a quilt mm -hmm. that's been haunting me for a long time because we made it, we did a friendship quilt with a bunch of ladies in the church during the during oh, yeah. the mm. quarantine lockdown. time. We, yeah, during the lockdown, we did a friendship quilt, and then I sewed all the top together. But I'm not I'm not experienced at like it's not a nice enough top from to hand quilt or something, mm -hmm. and I'm not experienced at sewing the whole. And I'm really challenging myself to like do it. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, you said basting is for sissies. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I ironed the backing before I before. sandwiched it together because I'm like, I know it's going to end up in a bunch of puckers and It'll things. It'll be a little And every phase has been a weird obstacle, mm -hmm. and, I've, and I'm still trudging along. Mm -hmm. I bought the walking foot. Oh, yeah. look at you. I know. Trying it out, Fancy and it's working Nancy now. There. I know. Yeah, really living in the uptown <laughs> life now. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, that buying a walking foot was a surprise for me, too, because mm. do you have one? Have you done that? I lost my zipper foot, like, years ago, and I've just been freewheeling ever since. <laughs> I have one foot. That's it. I wow. need to upgrade. So you don't have a walking foot, but you I probably don't. haven't done. But the walking foot is really interesting because it has the feed dogs on the top, too. Oh. So when you have sandwiched layers, it moves them through at the same time. Or like any fabrics mm. that tend to squick off yeah. when you're, you know, you're like trying yeah. to muscle and hold them together and they mm -hmm. don't do it. Mm -hmm. The feed dogs on um, the walking foot is the answer. Yeah. I'm feeling yeah. hot tip. There That's my go. tip. <laughs> Got a tip. I have two tips involved with that. Don't buy the one, like first I bought a cheap walking foot because I wasn't sure if it was what I needed. Yeah. And then I figured out it was what I needed, but it was not a good walking foot. So I had to buy the more, I just Invest. buy the one that goes with the sewing machine <laughs> that you have. Don't do this whole. Yeah. I actually, I have a whole bad situation. I only have one bobbin. And that's not You know, not Beck, fun. I think you should live a little and treat oh, yourself you to a zipper foot and some bobbin. I have tried to live a little and treat myself to the bobbin. <laughs> and every time... It's not the right size. <laughs> I have even gone with the bobbin to the store and holding them up so and they are not the right size. Speaking of bobbins, there could be a whole chapter in my book about the, the spiritual life of bobbins. <laughs> Whether or not bobbins can be demon possessed. I, I think they are. Like when you sew a whole thing and you're like, that looks pretty good. And you pull and it up and it's it just over. like... Uh, the, yeah. And it's sometimes with like grease streaks <laughs> on the thread, and it's just a it was huge, just a big matted. It's up. like a thread yeah. dust bunny stuck yeah, on the back on the side. Back. It's mm -hmm. really the worst thing ever. But really, it's the spiritual life of cheerfully correcting yeah. what ails your bobbin. <laughs> <laughs> Very difficult. All right, do you have a tip back? We should wrap oh, this, this up. This one might need to be called What Ails Your Bobbin? Because <laughs> what Ails Your Bobbin <laughs> and Even Exile Documentary coming. Stay tuned for more oh. domestic tips. <laughs> I don't have a tip. I've run out of ideas. Her tip is to not try to make a rag rug on no, yeah, your wall. No. Mm -hmm. Or at least research it on the internet first and find Figure out if other how people to have, tamp it down. More. Other people may have troubleshot this idea Maybe. since now. I kind of feel like if I'd been tying the threads in between. I think you would have ended up with a real loosey goosey operation. <laughs> would have been I already like one did of those end up it with would that. be like one of those um sushi rolling mats. <laughs> <laughs> like you would have a very weird it would not make a nice fabric. It yeah. would it would not be, because the whole point, with, not the whole point, but you weave and then you have to wash it so that it becomes a fabric 
together. Well, this was never supposed to be that. It was chunky rags. I know, but it, it was like still settles into like one thing yeah, well, rather it's than settled. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all for all coming. Right. Tune in for the yes. Even Exile documentary May sixth on the Canon yeah. app. Anywhere else that it's going to be? No. Canon Tune plus. in though. Canon Plus. Canon Plus. Yes. Until next time. Bye bye. Bye.